Stick around for the Unsaudi podcast. In your book, you start off with a dream. What was the dream that you had? <laughs> and I would actually like the story. I had this dream in 1993, which was, you know, eight years before I go to Guantanamo. And in the dream, I see myself in a prison. And I'm walking around in this prison kind of communal cell with other prisoners. And there are soldiers above us pointing guns towards us. And I'm saying to this person who's with me, I, I say, until when will we bear this humiliation? And he says, patience, brother, patience. And I say, you're always talking about patience. And at that moment, the soldiers start to fire. They start to shoot. And the prisoners all start to fall. The prisoners start to die. And I start to say, I start to scream the Adhan, like the call to prayer. And my voice echoes across the world. And somebody shouts to me from a distance, you're going to have a child born, but you're not going to see that child. And then in the, in the, uh, the dream, my hands raise in the Muslim style of prayer. And they go up, they go past the ceiling and they go into the clouds. My hands keep rising. And, and the dua or the, the supplication I, I make is, oh, oh, Allah, remove from us this terrible state of humiliation and degradation. And I, I do that. And I begin to cry. Now, in reality, I wake up crying next to my wife. And I tell my wife, which what she asked, what happened? This is the dream. And when I was in Bagram, nine years later, eight years later, held by the Americans, with guard towers above us with soldiers watching us, where I saw two prisoners beaten to death by the American soldiers, where I negotiated with the Americans to allow us to walk in circles because prior to that, we weren't even allowed to get up just for half an hour a day. I wrote to my wife and I said, the dream came true. That one dream I've ever spoken to you about, the only dream I've ever spoken to you about, it came true. And I'm in it right now. Uh, that's how I begin my, my book with that dream. That, that is a profound dream. And I believe, if at least personally for me, I feel like it was a form of mercy from Allah to, to allow you to be patient, to allow you to, to see that there's a plan, there's a wisdom behind all of this. Yeah, for sure. To me, that was unforgettable. The moment I walked into that detention facility and saw the, this, this, just the, they had something, the Americans had something called Overwatch. And Overwatch is literally, they built a, a ramp where soldiers walk up and down so they can see us from an elevated position. And that was unique. Because I, that, that in, in Guantanamo, they didn't have that. They had guard towers. But this is what I saw in my dream. Wow. The conclusion I had is there was kind of a bell curve. At one low end, there were actually hardened terrorists. There were others that were sometimes petty criminals and drug dealers. Not great people, but not criminal masterminds, not terrorists. And the, the top of the bell curve were people just a little more involved than what I just described. At the other end were people who were swept up and shouldn't have been there at all. How did you end up being one of the people that were taken? Of all people, why, why were you taken? Well, there's, there's two reasons. One is, one is a general and one specific to me. The general one is that after 9-11, the U.S. government, before they dropped bombs in Afghanistan, they dropped leaflets. And just to be clear, I, I was in Afghanistan when the war began. I was working on a project to build schools and weld, and we had a school going, even for girls at the time of the Taliban. And that's why I'd gone with my family to live there to help uh, uh, con construct and, and to and continue the curriculum at the school. You know, the Americans offered bounties of $5,000 each for a foreigner that people may suspect. So that was one reason. They're, literally, the Pakistan government received millions of dollars in bounty money. That, that's what it was, was essentially bounty money. The second that was more specific to me, which was the British intelligence services had come to my house back in 1998 uh, regarding the case of an individual who'd written to me from the Emirates saying that he'd been tortured in the presence of British agents and was for, for, forced to sign a confession that he's part of the Laden's organization. So when he'd written to me, he said, can you please help me with some lawyers? So I approached a lawyer here 
And that lawyer became my lawyer and still to this day is. So they came to me, MI5 came to me about the case of this guy. And this was 98, three years before 99. And the same MI5 agents that came to my house, who I offered tea to, who sat in my front room, were the same ones who turned up in Kandahar, in Bagram, and in Guantanamo. So they were, they made a connection. This guy knows this person and therefore he must be connected. And so it was false intelligence. And that's why when I came back to, to the UK, the, one of the first things I did was to take MI5, British Intelligence Service, to court. And in 2010, 2011, I won a massive case against them, a court, an out of court uh, settlement, me and several other prisoners. Tell me, walk me through your story of being arrested then. How did that happen? Well, first of all, I don't call it being arrested. You could be arrested, the police turned up, they give you rights. So, yeah, you know who's arresting you, you know where they're taking you, you know how long you're going to be helpful, you know what laws you're supposed to contravene. This was not an arrest, this was a kidnap. Literally, state sponsored. They turned up to my house in the middle of the night in Pakistan, which is where I'd gone to after the US had invaded Afghanistan, which is where I was living. And on the night of 31st of January 2002, the knock on the door in my house in Islamabad, which is where my family originated from, after all. In Pakistan, I opened the door, there's a bunch of people there, none of them in uniform, no identification. The only thing I see is guns, one of which goes right to my head, and an epic stun guns. And they force their way into my house, they push me onto the forecourt of the floor, they tie my hand on my back, tie my legs together, and the last thing I see before they get a hood over my head is them walking into the room with my wife and kids are asleep. And that's it. I don't see them again for the next three years. I don't know or didn't know at the time who these people were, but it was clearly they were Pakistani intelligence. But what was even more shocking that when they took me into this vehicle, they lay me in the back seat in the prone position, took the hood over my head, and in the front of the car, there's two white Caucasian males dressed unconvincingly as Pakistanis, asking me that I can answer their questions. We are all at the time in Guantanamo Bay. And Guantanamo had just opened, so the, the shocking images had reached the world. So it was clear to me then that this is, this is more than just the Pakistan intelligence. And then over the next three weeks, I was held in a secret location. And they told me, including British intelligence agents who'd come, that the only way out for you is to cooperate with the Americans. I said, cooperate regarding what? What do you think I've done? What do you think I'm a party to? Do you, can you tell me at which date, at which time, at which place you can say I've committed X amount of crimes? Or is this just a fishing trick that you can use to call the law now no longer applies? And um, they did tell me. They said, you have been illegally detained. So what the hell does that mean? Uh, and uh, they said, well, your detention holding you is illegal. But we are the world's most powerful law enforcement intelligence agencies. Who cares? What's anybody going to do about it? And they were right. Because this was, because America had got attacked, they could do whatever they want. And more shockingly, any country that had been asked, like Pakistan, like Britain, to take part in, in these war crimes that the Americans felt they had to do the same. So you weren't conspiring against the American people with the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or any other extremist group? British citizen. I'm, I've been born and raised in the UK. I, di I don't, didn't need a visa to go to the United States of America. The United States has multiple bases and assets and, and so forth in the UK. Now, the UK and America have a very strong relationship. If I had been a member of Al Qaeda, certainly it would have been made more sense for someone like me, who's multilingual after all, who has, you know, older person, been in Bosnia and whatever. Then I could have struck United States targets here. I could have damaged the United States from here. I could have traveled to the United States as some people attempted to, to harm, harm the United States. I didn't. I wasn't concerned with the United States at all. I've never been to America in my life, but America had come to me. I didn't commit any crimes against America, but I can rest assured that America committed a multitude of crimes against me and people like me. So that's the short answer. How did you end up in Bagrab and what kind of interrogation techniques did they use against you? So before they took me to Bagram, I was taken to a, 
a detention facility built by the Americans after they'd taken over Afghanistan, and that was in Kandahar. And this was after I was handed over by the Pakistanis to the Americans. Again, no legal process at all. Just a literal kidnap and hand over. I was stripped. I was punched, kicked, dogs salivating over me in the freezing uh, candle, humiliated, shaved my hair, my beard, and they did that to everybody else. So this was just the introduction of, of being taken into custody by Americans. And it was a shock for me because I'd been born and brought up in the UK and I, did, I was led to believe that the Americans were always the big guys. These are the good guys. And that perception changed dramatically over the next months and years. And after, so after the, after uh, Amber Hart held there for, for six weeks, I saw some really terrible things happen there. And again, it was unbelievable. It was a shock to the system. And then after about six weeks of being held there, I was sent to Bagram. Now, Bagram was a, a warehouse that had been built by the Soviet Union during their occupation of Afghanistan. And the Americans had made it into a detention facility. So I was held in the Bagram detention facility for about close to a year, 11 months. And in that time, it's hard to describe, but there's no communication. There was no communication at all with family. There was no letters, no phone calls, no visits. You're, you're literally in a, in a war zone. And I was in a cell, often a communal cell with other prisoners. And um, I saw two prisoners murdered by the US military. One with his hands tied to the top of the cage and repeatedly kicked and punched until he was dead. And another one who tried to escape, he was also murdered. I was subjected to the sounds of a woman screaming in the next cell during the interrogation when CIA and FBI agents threatened me. They said, if you don't cooperate, we're going to send you to Syria or to Egypt. And they had the sounds of a woman in the next cell, which they led me to believe was my wife being tortured while they brought pictures of my wife and children in front of me and waved them and said, where do you think they are now? What do you think happened to them? Do you think they're safe at home? And so there's all of this. This was, this was all part of what Bagaram was. And I often say to people that after a year of this place, I had no access to natural light, no access to cooked food. We got meals twice a day. In Ramadan, when it came and went, they gave us our meals four hours after uh, Iftara and several hours after Sahur, so you couldn't even eat the food. Floodlights are on 24-7, so you can never sleep properly. For a Muslim, you need water to make wudu when you're for your your, to, your to purification with water, but there was no water to wash with. It was just, just a a 500 milliliter bottle to drink once a day. So you had to do something called tayyaman, which is dry ablution, which is just to rub your hands together and rub your face. So you can't do the ritual purification. I did that for one year, and, and th there's so much more. This is just like a, a, a taste towards it. So by the time I went, I was sent to Guantanamo. I was actually looking forward to it. It can't be as bad as this. It can't be as bad as witnessing murder. It can't be as bad as having absolutely no rights. It can't be as bad as being subject to the sounds of a woman screaming you let the leaders of wife in the next cell. It can't be as bad as this. So uh, by the time they sent me to Guantanamo at the beginning of 2003, I was happy. For bad reasons, they didn't trust the criminal justice system. It gives too many rights to prisoners. There was a sense that the old rules had to be thrown out. We didn't want to give them those rights. Because we were so fearful of a new terrorist attack, we wanted to interrogate. And frankly, some parts of the U.S. government interrogated through torture. I mean, that fact. Did they use any interrogation techniques against you or others that stand out to you? What, what were some of the worst things that you saw in Bagram? I think it doesn't get worse than death. It doesn't get worse than murder. I saw them murdering two prisoners. It, it doesn't get worse than that. What was your relationship to God during this? Did you believe that God has forsaken you? Were you even able to be in the state to pray, to make wudu, to, to, to do all of this? Yeah, alhamdulillah, because I, I was aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God, he, he, if he loves you, he tests you. We believe that. But, and I've always known, I've known that from before. But when Allah loves a people, he tests them. When Allah loves a person, he tests them. In fact, he places us in this world to test to see which of you are the best indeed. That doesn't mean that my faith didn't go down and that I wasn't quite making you know, questioning and so forth. But it is faith, if anything, that saved me, it was faith. If there was anything that made me feel connected to this. You know, I went to, I went to a, a Jewish school, a Jewish primary school, as a child. 
And in that school, it's the first time I, I actually properly learned about the story of Joseph. They call the story of Joseph Yosef in Hebrew. And it is a story of imprisonment, but so much more imprisonment for a crime a person doesn't commit. But if he's not imprisoned, if he doesn't go through that process of imprisonment, then he's unable to do the next thing that he does, which is to show magnanimity to his brothers who had him thrown in prison and then show the rest of the world that there's actually a different way to deal with this. So I learned about this early on and I, and I took this on. I, I internalized the story of, of Joseph and Yusuf in the Quran and it helped me immensely, especially when I read it in the Quran as a prisoner by myself in solitary confinement. There was a lot more too and different aspects of my connection with God. My prayers have never been as so so profound as they were in Guantanamo, as they were in Babylon. I managed to learn, the, I mean, memorize the largest chapters of the Quran in Bagran because of that nature of that solitary confinement and nothing else to do, of course. So people may think, oh, it was a terrible thing, but I have to thank Allah, I have to thank God. But he gave me, he gave me a, a, an experience, the likes of which that I could have never experienced as a friend, free man, and then to, to learn from it and then perhaps even teach from it. Alhamdulillah. I heard you, you narrate a story of between you and a brother when you initially got kidnapped where he asked, what did, what did he say to you when you were both blindfolded and handcuffed? So this was on the airplane. I've been handed over now from the Pakistanis to the Americans. And the Americans initially, it sounds like, yeah, that, son, don't worry. Because I, I asked the American while I was, I was head, my hood was headed, are you going to be abuse us? Are you going to torture us? And he said, no, son, we don't do that. And he sounded you know, very, very convincing. But he was like, so the first thing they did was literally put me into the bowing position, my hands behind my back, my head is put in, my legs are shackled, my hands are shackled. And, he, and they push me in, barefooted into this aircraft. And it's a C-130 transport plane from what I've later learned. And there's dogs barking around us, there's, there's soldiers screaming at us. They're even cursing at us in Pashto and Arabic and Farsi in words that they can barely pronounce. And... They push me down, they force me down on, onto the ground. My legs are in front of me and my legs are shackled. As I said, my hands behind my back and my head put it. I notice to the left of me, there's a, there's a voice. The brother says, Salaam Alaikum, I reply. And then he asks me where I'm not from and we speak in Arabic and uh, we exchange those basic details. And then he says, brother, have you prayed the sunset or the Maghrib prayer? And I thought, subhanAllah, amazing. This guy is thinking about the Maghrib prayer. And I'm thinking about, you know, these guys going to take us to be executed or tortured or worse. And I didn't know what to say other than, no, I haven't prayed, brother. He said, I think we should pray because it, I think I think time for prayer has come up, though I don't know how we would have known because we've been in a blindfolded state for so long. So he, above the sounds of the roaring of the engine and the scream of the soldiers and prisoners and the dogs barking, I say, brother, you're on the left, so you lead the prayer. And so as he's about to lead, about to literally say, Allah, but an American soldier comes along and he takes out a knife and he puts it to my neck. And he says, if you speak again, and he swears at me, I'll slit your throat. And at this moment, the brother next to me, who's Libyan, he says, Allah, and now we're in this ritual state of prayer. So it really doesn't matter what, anybody does. I'm in prayer and I'm locked in prayer. And, and now I think about it, though it was frightening at the time, had he slit my throat and I'm praying, there can be no better death. There could have been no better death. But as it happens, he took the blade away from my throat and we continued to pray. And this was a prayer in which there's, you know, there's no ritual washing, there's no wudu, there's no standing, there's no bowing, there's no prostrating, none of those things that you normally are required to do in, in a prayer. But I think this was one of the most powerful prayers I've ever been involved in because it's straight from the heart and in the face of unimaginable odds. Was he able to continue to say Allahu Akbar and Sami Allah liman Hamida and stuff like that? Yes, of course. He did all of that. As I said, we continued that prayer until the very last As-Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, which he could do because you could turn your head. But I couldn't see him because we're both hooded. But we did our prayer. Did he recite Quran out loud? Yes, he did. Yes. 
and the soldier didn't get mad at you guys since he said not to speak again, right? I can't imagine what they were going to do. You know, what are you going to do? The guys, we're already tied up, our hands are behind our backs, the, the shackle, the hoods are over our heads. So they're taking us to some torture chamber anyway. I guess that was a uh, more bark than bite on the sides of the sh- soldier and that, you know, I'm going to slit your throat. I, I, I thought, even I thought there's no way he's going to do that. Hmm. The American flag flies again over our embassy in Kabul. Terrorists who once occupied Afghanistan now occupy cells at Guantanamo Bay. The original sin is that we created an institution outside and designed to be outside the rule of law. No more torture in our name. And shut it down and release everybody. Justice for Guantanamo detainees, now a cause celebre among human rights activists. So you were then taken to Guantanamo Bay after Bahram. Tell me about that. How did you end up in Guantanamo? What was life like in Guantanamo Bay? After a year of being in, in Kanda Uppers and then Bagram, I was kind of looking forward to being sent there because of the abuses and, and the terrible torture and, and, as I said, murder I'd witnessed. The playing journey was, was really painful. I was tied again down in, in a, this town on a chair as opposed to on the floor. But my mouth was, I had a face mask over my mouth, it was blacked out goggles over my face, I could, over my eyes I couldn't see, and ear defenders, so I couldn't hear. And then my hands were chained to my, to my waist and the chain ran from my waist to my legs. So I'm sitting like this. And I think the journey lasted for about 36 hours. You can't even scratch your own nose. And I begged the soldiers for a sedative and they gave me something that knocked me out most of the journey. I woke up in a daze. And I remember, uh, you know, there's a scene out of Rambo that I, that when they're, they're washing the guy down with, with a jet. And, uh, I remember waking up to that. They're spraying me with this, with this water jet with a hose and trying to rub me down with a, a stick with a sponge at the end of it, like I'm some kind of a creature. And then I remember them taking me across this really hot gravel into this room, and inside this room is a cell. And the cell and the room are newly painted. You can felt, smell this fresh paint. That cell it measures about eight foot by six foot, and you, there's no window. You can't see anything outside there. The only thing you can see is the soldier or the soldiers who are guarding you. And that's it. N- nothing else. And in that, inside the cell, there's a, there's a small tube of see through transparent toothpaste. There's a, there's a toothbrush that is about the size of your fingernail. There is a, a bar of soap about the size of half your finger. And there's, there's a, a mat, a thin mat that's on top of the, the metal bunk. And then there's a metal toilet attached to a metal basin. And that's it. That's all that's in the cell. These are my kind of possessions. This is my area. This is my home for the next two years. You have a famous saying that it was three three steps forward and three steps backward. Is that the cell? Yeah. So all the cells measured this. That was the kind of uh, the the ability. If you want to take a walk in one animal cell, that's what you do. Three steps forward, three steps, three steps back, and that's it. And if you want to take a, a walk and try to pace yourself and see how long it'll take you to do, say, a mile, you've got to kind of calculate that in your head with, with a few thousand times. I can't remember now how much it was, but that's it. That was it. In addition to that, they had something called recreation in the beginning. It changed after a year or so. But in the beginning, recreation meant 15 minutes twice a week. So half an hour in a week. And these 15 minutes, they don't just take you out like this. They'd have to call for infantry patrol, which has to come around this camp where I was held, Camp Echo, where there's only two cells. And after the infantry patrol, they bring in something called the military working dog, the MWD. So a guy comes with this dog and he's waiting outside for you to come outside the cell. But before you come outside the cell, two of the soldiers make sure you're shackled up. They, you've got to put your hands through the beam hole at the front and they shackle them up. Then you stand and turn around. They put a, a, the, shack, the chain around your waist. They, they padlock that. And then there's a beam hole at the bottom for your ankles and they shackle your ankles. And then the soldiers, when you walk out, one holds either one of your arms. And then there's another soldier that comes with his sidearm, with his pistol taken out. And he's literally standing like this behind you, inching to behind you 
as you move. And that's the pistol at the pistol at you. And they take you out into this caged area, which is about 15 foot by 15 foot, completely caged from top to bottom. You can't see anything outside. There's there's a protective screening all around. So you can't really see anything outside at all, other than soldiers. They put you in this cage, you're there for 15 minutes. That entire process just to take you out for 15 minutes. Now, I'm a short guy, and most of the American soldiers are huge and massive. And I used to look at them and think, my God, you've created in yourselves a story. You frighten yourself so much that you can't see how ridiculous it is. But I, I couldn't help but feeling like, you know, that I'm one of the most dangerous men on the planet. And, and that's what they'd done to themselves. They'd frightened, hyped themselves up that much that you need all of this just to get this out, guy out of the cell. It's like something out of Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter or something like that. And, and, and I couldn't help but think, well, these guys actually live the Hollywood they watch. It, it's not even a joke. Uh, but to us from the rest of the world, it seems absolutely bizarre. Major Michael Morrie believes the treatment of inmates at Guantanamo Bay is appalling. He's seen his client's mental state deteriorate dramatically. I think sitting in solitary confinement for over two years is abuse. I think not allowing a person to go outside and um, have access to sunlight for over eight months is abuse. That is mistreatment, clearly. You were in solitary confinement, I believe, for two years in that cell? Yeah, I was in that camp. It's called Camp Echo. I was there for about two years. And I, when I say solitary confinement, I mean I have no access to any other prisoner. Eid came and went. Ramadan came and went. Prayers and all of that stuff that we do communally as Muslims, none of that was going on. I was trying to do it myself. There is no timetable. There's no clock. There's no watch. There's no calendar. All of the most basic things a human being requires to, to, to you know, just to live. Human beings, writing letters. Uh, I did write letters sporadically through the Red Cross. But those letters have to go through screening. By the time they get to my family, sometimes they completely stop that letter from going or they black out or redact, as they call it, so much that you can read nothing. And the opposite is true, too. My seven-year-old daughter wrote me a letter once, and I could only read two sentences. The first sentence is, Assalamu alaikum, Baba. Everything else that this seven-year-old has written in her seven-year-old style childish writing has been blacked out. And somebody's gone out and blacked out each word. And then at the end, I love you, Baba. That's it. So that kind of thing happened to me and the hundreds of prisoners regularly. And you couldn't understand why. What's going behind the soldier's mind that's doing that? What kind of a person feels that it's okay to do this to a person? Remember, you're holding people without charge or trial. They've never been to charge, to court. They've never been charged. They've been tortured. And in addition to this, now you're doing this, this to them. So it taught me something about the system. This isn't, wasn't necessarily each individual American soldier. This was a system, and this system just simply does not care about individuals and their rights. What was going on through your mind and heart during these times? How, how can someone survive through something like this? My faith was extremely important. Reading the Quran regularly, trying to contemplate on this verse series, trying to understand things in ways that I couldn't. Well, there's a there's a, there's this, for example, there's a verse in Surah Al Talaq, which is about divorce. But it says, Whoever fears Allah, He will make a way out for them and provide for them from where they never imagined. Now, this, is, this verse is about a woman who's in a state of divorce. Right? He'll make a way out for you, provide for you. But I equally understood this verse for me that this helps this. If I fear Allah, if I keep my, to my duty to him, then he will find me a way out and he will give me provision from when I never imagine. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. On the next episode of the Ansari podcast. It's amazing how friendships can develop in such a place and we're together and there's nobody else watching. And it has an effect. There are those who became Muslims in Guantanamo. There are those who became Muslims after Guantanamo. I'm your host, Mahmoud Ansari, and this is the Ansari podcast.